I'm going to start by asking a question. Um, we've been talking a lot about leadership. If you had to find one word that kind of summarizes summarizes leadership in this context, what would it be? One word. Service, vision, influence. Yeah. They're all right, but that's what I was looking for, influence. Because generally when we think about leadership, we think about somebody who is out in front and people following. We think about leadership, we think about somebody who is giving commands. But the only reason why people would follow or should follow is if you have influenced them. If you have made them change the way they think about things, if you have made them change the way they approach things. So leadership is not um, all about being out in front and giving the commands or being the subordinate and uh, supervised uh, relationship. It's all about how you influence. So as we think through natural resources, I'd like you to think about that word influence. How could you influence change? Not just in your understanding, but in the way that um, it's all brought together. Natural resources in Africa, we have a lot of that, a lot, a lot of approaches. I like these two um, news um, clippings. They're within one month of each other, and they're reporting on natural resources in the same country, the same deposits. And in October of 2013, the top one, which is a Reuters news agency report, talks about natural resources being the cause of chaos and conflict in Kenya. One month later, the same natural resources, this time Bloomberg, natural resources are the best thing that ever happened. So which one is right? Because if you are going to rely on the media for your answer, you're going to be confused. So what I want to do this morning very quickly is, first of all, define natural resources. What are we talking about? And then say a little bit about um, natural resources and uh, conflict and security, what the nexus looks like. Then what are some of the implications of not managing natural resources? Well, how does this link to the security sector and security challenges in Africa, and then I'll kind of bring it together in terms of summaries and recommendations. Okay. Natural resources basically refer to what those of us who were in high school in the 1970s used to call raw materials. These are, these are things, not just minerals, it could be land, it could be um, agricultural produce, it could be timber, it could be fisheries, anything that has not been processed that's available generally falls under the rubric of natural resources. Um, some of them are renewable, like timber. You could plant the trees again, it'll take a while, but it'll come back. Some of them are non-renewable. You dig them out of the ground and that's it. But generally, this discussion about natural resources in Africa always tends to focus on the minerals, okay? Whether it is um, mineral ores or gemstones or the hydrocarbons, gas and oil. For simplicity, a lot of our conversation today would be about the minerals, primarily um, the gems, oil, and uh, gas, and, and the mineral ores. Um, not because we're discounting or we're defining natural resources um, narrowly, but because of time. Okay, we, 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 we could do, you know, a, 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 we could have other conversations about this, but just know that when we talk about natural resources, henceforth, we'll be looking mainly at the um, mineral sector, but the definition is much broader. We always talk about 
Africa being blessed with a lot of natural resources. Here, let's talk thinking about the minerals in particular. Um, but when we talk about the natural resource wealth in Africa, what are we talking about? Is this about the amount of natural resources that exist on the in the continent, or is it about the relative um, dependency? i.e. how much African countries depend on one or two natural resources. What exactly are we talking about? Because if we don't have that definition clear in our head, we'll be like the journalist. Sorry, I hope we don't have any journalists in the room. We'll be like the journalist in the first slide who can't determine whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. So as professionals, as analysts, thinking about your, about your country, you need to know. I remember going to visit one country and we were talking about oil. The minister of oil in that country did not know how much oil his country produced. He didn't know. He said, oh, the companies know that. And uh, for most African countries, we don't really have a clue about what we're talking about when, when we say mineral and mineral wealth. You need to know that before you start. And um, uh, this is a chart from the um, African Progress Report. By the way, all, the, all um, presentations are going to be on GlobalNet. So if you miss any slide, you can get, get on, on GlobalNet. This is a, a quick slide that shows, um, it's not a really good slide, but it shows how much, um, na how, 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 how much each country has by way of its principal natural resource and the percentage of world exports. And you can see for some African countries, it is pretty high. Um, in particular, in particular, you look at, this is cobalt in, in Congo, over half world, platinum in South Africa, and so on. So, in a sense, there is a strategic element to the endowment. This chart um, shows um, natural resource exports and revenue as a percentage of total exports in countries. Again, not a really good, um, not a really good um, chart in terms of um, readability from where you are, but you would see that for most countries, by way of exports, over this is what they call the sustainability threshold. Let's not think about this, but you could if you look at fifty percent for most resource-producing African countries, one natural resource accounts for over half of the um, exports and also in terms of resource revenue. What does this mean? Does anybody know what the world price of um, oil per barrel is right now, roughly? Yeah, it's about... Yeah, it's about 50. Let's just say 50 to have a nice round number. Do you know what it was last year? So, what happens when a country goes, a country that's here, relying on one commodity for most of its exports and most of its revenue, when the price for that um, commodity is reduced by 50%, what happens to the country? That's, that's, a, that's, that's a security issue right there. And that's a planning issue right there. And that impacts us in ways that we're going to discuss um, later. Um, unfortunately, um, these charts don't, I thought, I thought, I thought they'll be bigger, but they just give you a sense of the natural resources by way of minerals in a number of African states. 
and it compares the natural resource endowment with development and security and governance indicators. And the reason why I have this slide is because there is something called the resource curse. Has anybody heard of it? Okay, and which basically states that um, countries that um, produce, that have natural resources are most likely to be underdeveloped and conflict affected. We've all heard that, right? And um, let by showing hands, how many people agree that that is true? How many people don't agree that that is true? How many people just cannot be bothered? <laughs> but um, the reason why this is important is because it shapes the way we approach natural resources from a planning perspective. If we go in with that assumption, then that is what informs everything we do by way of financial planning, by way of governance, by way of management. But before we get to that um, part of things, the reality is that if you look at the empirical work, the econometrics that started this whole debate, it is not conclusive. There is no empirical basis for the resource curse. You can, if you, the equations that they use in the econometrics, if you change one or two variables, you get the opposite. Think about it historically as well. From a historical perspective, it's not necessarily deterministic. A number of countries today that are doing well are resource rich. So the question then becomes, so from a both econo econometrically, historically, and structurally, there is no e empirical or theoretical basis that substantiates a resource curse per se. But what then how then do you explain the resource-rich countries across the African continent? And that's part of what we're going to get to towards the end. But I think it's important um, to know that, um, as particularly from a policy and a planning perspective, this is a little bit more complex than it looks. This is military spending by African countries, um, selected African countries, um, starting from 2000 to 2013. And this is, of course, this is also publicly available um, data. You can get this from the website. If you can't get it from the website, send me an email, I'll send you the, the database. This is what, this is, in aggregate terms, in actual money terms, this is what these African countries, one, two, three, four, five, just six of them, have been spending on their military. You can see that um, 2000 to 2005, it was about flat, but since 2006, there has been a gradual increase. Uh, the countries where you have the most increases are the resource-rich countries. And again, you have to ask yourself the question. And uh, next week, um, you'll be hearing from Dr. Malakaish uh, on budgeting and procurement. And he'll tell you about some of the key principles of budgeting. So what happens to a national budget when the price for your main commodity, let's say oil, is reduced by 50%? There is an element, th there are two things that um, come to play. One, you have to make a decision. That's a trade-off. Secondly, you have to decide among options. That's contestability. How do you do it? And this kind of shows that 
the natural resource issue is not so far away from the defense and military. It is linked directly through the financial flows that accrue from natural resources. We talked a little bit about, again, I'm, I apologize for the um, slides. They're not um, doing me justice. Um, we talked a little bit about natural resources and flows and outflows. And I think I mentioned briefly during the opening about the leakages from the African continent. And a number of people have calculated, you know, how much money leaves the African continent. And what this chart shows are results for Nigeria, Algeria, South African Customs Union, Cote d'Ivoire with cocoa, and Zambia from copper. In each of these, each of these countries are typical of the African continent, right? And on the African continent as a whole, I said the last time, the amount that leaves the African continent every year is between 50 and 80 billion US dollar equivalent. 50 to 80 billion. And one of the things people ask is, where does all that money go? All right. What this chart shows is some of the um, researchers did some forensic financial analysis and to look like when people do tr transfer pricing or misinvoicing or trade related theft, let's call it what it is. These are some of the countries it goes to. The, the, the funds, this is where, where they will attract the funds. Okay, Nigerian oil, United States, Spain, France, Japan, Germany, Algerian oil, Germany, Turkey, Canada, Tunisia, United States, and so on. What this, what, what, what this suggests is that there are two sides to this natural resource issue. There's a lot that should be done within the African continent, and there's also a lot that has to be done outside the African continent. It has to be complementary. And when you look at the, na the natural resource issue, if I ask, if I'd asked at the beginning of this um, discussion, you know, what's it, what are the, what do we, what causes the natural resource issue? The first thing we'll hear is corruption. And when we think corruption, you think about, you know, government corruption, but corporate corruption is a lot more insidious. And um, uh, it's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to. This, um, for those of you who are academically inclined, this is a really good um, book available online, PDF, that talks about this whole resource curse um, issue that gives a summary of the empirical evidence, some of the historical evidence, the structural issues, and discusses this issue of correlation and causality a little bit, a little bit better. Okay. So we've talked generally about natural resources and uh, the resource curse. So do natural resources themselves cause instability in themselves? Um, there's a lot of work that has been done. I want to talk about two sets of um, theories that look at how natural resources themselves could inherently be um, triggers for instability. The first was um, first um, summarized by a French um, political economist, Philippe Le Billion. And um, he kind of said, well, you have two different types of um, natural resources. You have some that you find in one place, that you can extract in one place. Okay, and those he called the point resources. That's like oil. You have one drill. Okay, 
and you have others that are spread out over a wide area, like alluvial diamonds or like tin ore mining in the DRC. And what he found was that when you have a point resource located near a major administrative area like the capital, you're more likely to see an overthrow or a coup d'etat, whereas where it's on the periphery, you're more likely to see secession. And the reason is because of the ability of the government, which is usually in the large cities, to project administrative authority. And where the, and it's if you were to plot it, the further away you go from the main city, the less effective governance becomes. And because of that, you have different types of instability. Where you have a diffused resource is all about how you control. And there you're more likely to see warlordism because you'll have different pockets of authority that, you, that, that we saw during the Mano River um, crisis, we are also seeing in parts of, the, of northeastern DRC today. Okay. We have um, some financials here that give you a sense of, um, and this is from a 2012 IMF working paper on, an, on natural resources. We're just seeing a number of countries, natural resources, and uh, what, the, um, what some financials tell us. Let's take Mozambique, for instance. Mozambique's natural gas endowment, if all the contracts were done well, natural gas and coal alone could be providing 3.5 billion US dollars in tax every year. Yes, fiscal revenue. Every year. Just, th just those two. But the t you need to have the right um, contracts, etc. But to be able to get this 3.5 billion, somebody has to invest about 20 to 30 billion dollars up front. Why is the upfront investment so heavy? And this is the same in most African countries. It's because at the site of the natural resource, there's no infrastructure. There are no roads, there are no pipelines, there's no electricity, there's no water. Somebody has to do all of that first. And that is usually the beginning of sorrow for many resource-rich countries on the continent. Because if you didn't know me, you are here in this hotel, and um, you're having your coffee break, and I walked up to you, and I said, Sir, could you loan me $5? I need to buy a coffee. I forgot my wallet. What, 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 you never knew me before. What would you say? <laughs> you know what I would say? <laughs> I, <could, laughs> I wouldn't tell you what I would say. But the issue then becomes, in your mind, you are calculating risk. Okay? If I, if I were to loan this person the money, would he or she pay me back? He might look at me and look at my suit and say, I think he has a job, so he'll, he'll pay me back. At least a suit. Yeah, <laughs> at least he has a suit. And if he doesn't pay me back, I could probably um, take his watch and sell it. But for most resource-rich African countries, that's the problem. Because when the investor looks at the African country, in his or her risk, um, risk calculus, sees 
a history of instability, a history of conflict. Contracts cannot be enforced because the courts are, as we were discussing yesterday, probably corrupt. The banks may not allow for the kind of financial transfers my business wants. But the return on my investment will be high. So what do I do as an investor if I'm interested in, in, in those returns? I sign a contract that's for my benefit. I let the country bear all the risk and I do a second thing. Because if I'm concerned about the enforceability of rules and regulations, and I'm also concerned that I don't want the government to wake up one day and nationalize the mines, then I lose all my investment. I need to have people I can trust in authority. That's where the corruption starts. Because it doesn't start as it doesn't start as corruption. It starts as we are all friends. So I'm as one friend to the other, I'll finance your campaign. You'll become an MP or a minister or the president. I don't mean ill for the country, but I'm just worried, like you would be worried, right? Right. And that's how, if you look across the board, you have a lot of contracts signed by resource-rich countries that result in corrupt politics, result in oppressive politics. Why? Because of this. Sorry for the um, clickers. Because of this. The government is supposed to be relating to its people, providing its people with services and security. And the people are supposed to reciprocate by paying taxes and owing allegiance to the government. But the government is a lot more concerned with the natural resources. Why? One, it's a private bank. There is embezzlement that goes on. But secondly, the people who do the exploitation of the natural resources fund their campaigns. So it's not just the financial influence. It's not just the financial inflows. It's the influence that the corporate entities have on the government. So the governments are a lot more focused on the welfare and well-being of the natural resource and its exploitation than its people. If you look at um, conflict in Africa today, it's mainly this contestation. It's a lot of civil unrest. Okay, yes, you do have the violent non-state actors, blah, 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 but it's a lot of this unrest. And where does this unrest come from? It comes from this breakdown in the social contract between the people and their governments, which is reinforced by this relationship that's at the bottom. And so when we think about natural resources, let's not just only think about natural resources from who is coming in to steal Africa's natural resources. Think about what it does structurally and politically, not just to the country, but to society. And a lot of the, if you, if you think about it, you trace a lot of the insecurity back. You say it's governance and leadership, but there's a reason why governance and leadership looks like that. It is because of the way natural resources are being mismanaged. Because in most African countries, we don't have industry, we don't have manufacturing. The key exports are one or two natural resources. The countries don't have the 20 to 30 billion themselves to invest in the natural resources, so it has to come from outside. 
And that's, this is the cycle that we need to understand a lot better and that we need to break down in Africa. If Africa's natural resources are ever to become proper national resources. Okay, let me crave the indulgence of my clickers and go back a little bit. Okay. Just giving you a couple of um, references for a lot of what I've been talking about as far as the outflow of the financial resources that come from our natural resources. Um, the African Union actually has a whole commission that is focused on this. Um, so does the um, OECD in Paris. And um, there is research. And again, this is why we are at a university. This is not CNN. Um, we have research that shows that the, a lot of what leaves the um, continent, 65% is from illicit financial flows. That's this trade theft. 30% from narco trade and illegal activities, smuggling, etc. And what we, we would term corruption, i.e. theft by our government, etc., it's only about 5%. But 5% of about, about 80 billion is still a lot to be stolen by our leaders. But the problem is a lot more complex. This shows um, three different estimates of losses, okay, from three different um, research, re, um, research efforts, and just showing how it's grown over the years, beginning from. 20, from 2000 through 2008, and now it's a lot more than this. What this tells us is that it's a problem that is not going away. And as long as it keeps increasing, we're going to have, A, some of the social pressures that we've had for a, a while, and secondly, we're always going to have this outflow. Not because people are coming in to steal Africa's resources is because we don't have our eyes open and we don't understand the um, insidious um, dynamics that are at play. This is um, a chart from the Africa Progress Report um, of 2013. This is Kofi Annan's think tank in Geneva. They produce a report every year. And in 2013, it focused on the extractive industry. And I like this chart because what it did was using, I think they used um, 2011, 2011 or 2010-ish data, but they show that inflows into Africa are almost, were almost equal 2010, 2011 to the outflows, illicit outflows and trade, and, um, trade um, financing. So, when we ask the question, does Africa have the resources to ensure its security and governance? I think, from my perspective, uh, the answer is yes. We rely on total aid, foreign aid coming into Africa every year. It doesn't exceed $40 billion. The entire African continent. But yet we lose... Twice that. And so the we, we really have to take a, a different look at it. Um, I'm going to skip this one. All right. So we are talking about the connection between the natural resource mismanagement and um, uh, security outcomes. We've talked a little bit about the political side, we've talked about the governance and the social contract side, um, but there's the other dynamics that are, to, that are coming to play. I joke at times that if you have a map of Africa and you throw a dart, 
anywhere it lands, there's a natural resource there. Seriously. If you look over the last few years, like the oil and gas finds in particular over Africa, every country is finding oil and gas that is, you know, commercially viable. But one of, one of the things that I noticed that I haven't seen in a lot of literature is that in some cases, you're finding these new finds in areas that already have ethnic tensions. And um, there was a lot of press um, a couple of years ago about the um, Turkana in Kenya because oil had been found, it was in a contested region, and the Turkana where they, well, the Turkana had two issues. One, they had contested borders with other ethnic groups, and they wanted to make sure that they defined what was theirs. But then they had issues with the companies coming in and the role of the government. And so there was a bit of unrest. The military had to be sent down because the police could not and that could not um, contain it. But some some people might say, "Oh, well, it's just a little bit of agitation by the locals." If you rewind in the Niger Delta when the Ogoni um, issue started in the 80s. Most people said, oh, it's just a playwright and a few other people. They ended up executing them. The um, Ken Sarawiwa and, uh, and, and the others. But what happened a few years later? It became a Niger Delta conflict. And to this day, the impact of, the, of that conflict um, still persists. Currently in, um, in the Niger Delta, because of instability and insecurity in the Niger Delta, there's about between 200 to 250,000 barrels of oil a day that cannot be pumped because of instability. 200 and to 250,000 barrels of oil a day. By way of comparison, that's all the oil Sudan pumps. There's another dimension, border areas. A lot of the oil, particularly the offshore and um, lake um, oil deposits, you're finding in contested border areas. And two normally peaceful countries, for example, Tanzania and Malawi, they've had, you know, a bit of um, diplomatic um, issues around the Ruvuma Basin deposits. And um, again, is it far-fetched? Is it an impossibility that this would lead to some sort of conflict? Stranger things have happened on the African continent. And so this is basically just a watch list, things that could spark unrest. All right, a question that a lot of people ask is, well, how does, um, how do natural resources, is there any relationship between natural resources and non-state actors, like your Al-Shababs and uh, Boko Harams and Lord's Resistance Army, do they get funding from these um, resources? Because in some areas, you have oil, but in other areas, you have these diffused and uncontrolled resources. And um, do these groups gain um, capital or financial resources from these natural resources to um, foment um, unrest? What I've done here is some research. Um, on the relationship between violent extremist organizations and and um, I, in, in illicit financial flows. Do they get their money from it? Uh, but basically, it's inconclusive. You can't say because you have um, 
natural resources in the area, you're going to have violent extremist organizations coming up. Let me give a quick example, again, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, uh, there was a time we, 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 the international community, and the United States believed that if we could only stop the groups from mining and exporting mineral ores, we would, the conflict would subside. And so we um, put into law something called the um, conflict financing, um, um, sorry, the, con the um, conflict verification mechanism as part of a broader law called the Dodd-Frank law. And some of you may or may not have heard about it, but what that law basically said was any company registered or doing business in the United States that gets its gold, tin, tungsten, or tantalum that uses gold, tin, tungsten, or tantalum in its manufacturing process has to certify that those minerals did not come from Congo or its neighbors because we wanted to make sure that we didn't have conflict minerals you know, getting into the formal sector. That is commendable, um, but the real reason why there's conflict there is not the minerals. The minerals are just you know, a convenient way to pay for the war. So we had that in, uh, it became um, law in, uh, it became, the law became effective in 20, 2012, and um, conflict, conflict, the trade in conflict minerals went down. In 2012 to 2013, the world was introduced to a new group called the M23, which was worse than everyone, <laughs> most of the come before it. Does anybody know how the M23 got its money, its seed money, to establish and start doing its work? No, not, not drugs. Sorry? Local leaders. Local leaders, no. Think Bonnie and Clyde. They robbed two banks. They robbed this, the branch of the central bank in Goma, and they robbed one commercial bank. And they started to fund their activities. So the issue is not as simplistic as you ha because you have natural resources, because you have quote unquote conflict minerals, it's going to fund conflicts. It's understanding the root causes of the conflict and then using what I would call all um, instruments of national power to address the conflict, rather than just looking at natural resources as the main culprit. And you could have all of this, even I looked at natural resources and terrorism, it's not as straightforward. Okay, this is by way of um, conclusion. There are a number of um, challenges. Um, I think the first is the fact that natural resources are a high value, low frequency contract. Meaning that companies that do natural resources don't sign those contracts every day or every year or every 10 years. One contract sustains the company for a long time. So when that one contract is being um, signed, the company will do anything to get that contract. They'll offer you anything. And uh, that's where the ethical leadership part comes in. It's a very, very difficult position to be in, a very difficult issue to address. But the nature of natural resource contracting makes it susceptible to both um, corruption and also mismanagement. The second is that the 
political economy is very intertwined with natural resource exploitation. Who buys and sells, who wins elections, who owns real estate, they're all connected. And so looking at natural resources alone is problematic. There are external influences, but once again, it is not countries wanting to come in and steal Africa's um, re natural resources. It is the way the contracting is done. That's, that, that is the issue. Um, we've talked a lot about publishing what you pay. Um, there's a, an international initiative called the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative that forces countries to publish the contracts. But some of these contracts are pretty complicated and complex. And uh, so there's a lot of education and sensitization that is necessary. And not because we're talking down to people, but it's just very complicated. Um, uh, and so we really need to um, know how to manage the external um, partners or stakeholders who are involved here. We have to ensure um, corporate social responsibility, that the companies who do business in our countries, we hold them to the same standard that we would like to be held. But we generally give them a break and a pass. We allow them not to pay taxes. We allow them not to clean up after they pollute. Um, uh, shell, oil in the Niger Delta. When, after a lot of agitation, we started with Ken Sarawira, who was ex executed for raising it. When they finally did the environmental impact assessment, the United Nations Environmental Program found that it's going to take 10 years and billions of dollars to clean up what Shell, not a Chinese company, Shell, a European company, did to the Niger Delta by way of pollution. And so, but then, yeah, we blame Shell, but you also blame the governments who didn't ensure that they did the right thing. And lastly, um, value chain governance. Um, if you think about any natural resource from when it leaves the ground to when it um, becomes a consumer product, for example, one of the most important elements in any cell phone requires a tin ore. And most of the tin ore on this planet is found in Northeastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. Even if there were no, um, even if there were no conflict, etc., the way the value chain is organized right now is only about 2% of the value remains in Congo. Most of it happens after it leaves Congo. And that's the same for oil. Nigeria um, produces and pumps about 2.2 billion barrels of oil every day. Well, it has minimal refining capacity. So it just goes, and then they buy refined oil. And it's the same across, same across the board. We have to be thinking strategically. And why do we have to think strategically? Because we know of all the different ways we have discussed this morning that mismanagement, theft, or lack of planning with natural resources could create a situation that makes our job as security sector professionals a lot more difficult. And we could be part of influencing not just thought, but also influencing the way um, our communities and our countries view this natural resource and understanding its connection with um, security.